So hello everybody. Today we're going to tackle a really interesting topic. How do the bow and the string interact to make a tone on a stringed instrument? To really understand this and to get a very clear insight into the whole topic, we need to figure out some basics first. Let's start at the very, very core of it. What is music? Music is basically air in motion. It's compressed air that's moving moving with a speed of 340 meters per second, by the way, which is like um, one kilom kilometer in three seconds or a mile in five seconds. And um, so we're right from the beginning, we're in the middle of physics, but, but well, I promise I won't throw too many numbers or formulas at you. Okay, but you, you, have, you have experienced that like, for example, when you experience a thunderstorm and first you hear the flash and only a few seconds later you hear the thunder. And that's because the sound wave takes a while to arrive at you. And you also experience that in a large concert hall when you see the player acting and only a second or two later you hear the sound. Um, now, what arrives at your ear, of course, if that's a thunderclap or a violinist playing a chord, is not the same thing. And so the sound wave has a very specific profile in how it looks. And it's actually not a simple sine wave like we can show here for demonstrations. So where you can see the amplitude and the period, so the amplitude gives this, the, the power of the vibration and the period, the frequency. And um, so this would be like a computer sound, something very, very simple, not very beautiful maybe. And but what does arrive on your ear when you listen to a violin is something that looks like this. This is a waveform of a violin. Do take a very close look because, you know, there's a lot of information coded in this waveform. And your ear and your brain is actually able to understand this as, okay, this is a violin. Though, if you look at it very closely, you will see that every one of these teeth has a slightly different profile, which is, by the way, perfectly normal for every real instrument, which makes it easy or relatively easy for us to tell between a real instrument and a synthesizer, because a synthesizer is like a robot walking. You know, every step is the same. If a human being walks, every step is different. So you can tell. But let, let's go back to the to 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 how this this is um, you know the sine wave. How does that come into such a complex way? We need to find that out. And first of all, um, what should happen is that in a string instrument we have a fundamental resonance, and as you see in this picture. On top of that fundamental, we have all the overtones. And in a fixed string, each, every, each overtone or the overtone series is numbered by the um, manifold of the fundamental resonance. So if we start with a C, 131 hertz, the second overtone is at 262, and the third at 393, and so forth. And if you add up these six overtones, and really put them all together, uh, which you see in this next picture, is 
you get something like a sawtooth. It's not, we're not yet at this shark tooth profile, but we, we have some tooth profile here. So, so we're, we're getting in the right direction, okay? Um, we, this is called a Fourier analysis or synthesis. Uh, you can do that backwards and forwards. Like when you have uh, this, the shark tooth profile, um, you can deduct which fundamental and overtones are experienced here. And if you add up not only until the sixth overtone, like in this graph, but up to the sixth, 30th, um, you get a real sharp sawtooth, uh, like in this picture. Okay. So that's one. So that's the basic idea. We have a fundamental with overtones and that adds up to a sawtooth profile, but which is not exactly what we're hearing. Okay, so there's more happening. Now let's let's take a look at what actually happens in reality on the instrument. First of all, let's take a look at how a string vibrates. Now this is this can be best seen on a on a, um, the lowest double bass string, which is the E string. And as you see, the string goes from one side to the other. Or at least that's what our eyes want us to believe, because that's not what's happening at all. What is really happening, we can show you on this video here. Look closely. So what you see is not the string going from one side to the other, but there's a kink that runs up and down the string. So completely different from what we see or what we think we can see. Just our eyes are not fast enough. All right. Now, when we try to, to put this video into an animation, it would look like this. And, and here you can see the stick slip effect really nicely, um, where there's this red circle, um, the bow hair sticks to the string, and then when the kink moves between the contact point and the bridge, it slips and then the bow catches the string again and so it goes round and round. So to make it more easy for you to, to understand, um, I've, I've made this little picture here. So where you can see this is like an up bow um, on the string and here's, you can see all the parts here. And, and, and this is the first takeaway for today. On an up bow, this king moves counterclockwise on a down bow clockwise. So when you change the bowing direction, you have to stop the string and start it all over again. So there's no way to make a continuous vibration of the string and change the bowing direction. That's impossible. So don't even practice that. What helps a little bit is that the body keeps resonating while you change the bowing. So you can trick it a little bit if you're really quick and really soft in the bow change. It will, will sound quite evenly, but um, you, you cannot really play an uninterrupted tone. That, that's very important to understand. All right. Um, Now look, let's look at that waveform of that violin again. So here's something more happening and, and we, we need still, still need to find out what exactly. Because if, if we look at the video again, you will see that this king that runs around the string is not perfectly sharp because this the string has some stiffness so it doesn't bend really 
like like on an edge like a kink but it it's rounded off so there's some deformation so we cannot have a perfect overtone range even if you only look at that string and also if you look at the part of the string behind it before the kink or the, the rounded edge uh, you will see it's not always perfectly flat so there's there's some complex stuff going on there and we will look into that a little later okay but first let's let's take a look at other instruments um, we have uh, we've seen this this um, uh, the shark tooth form of a violin and we see that in the first column but the same tone played on a trumpet or flute or an oboe has a very different waveform and we can identify these now how does this special waveform of the violin come about and that is of course we first have that fundamental and overtones made in the string all made with this with a few modulations already but what happens next is this vibration then goes into the bridge and here's the first modulator and filter because the bridge reacts differently to different vibrations then it goes into the instrument's body and again the instrument's body moves in very peculiar ways and um, and supports some of these fundamentals and overtones and others not so much and so the whole instrument is like a modulator um, and this combination of uh, fundamental with a full range of overtones and several modulators then bring out this special sound profile now how does it happen that some of these overtones are not supported part of that is damping so for for an overtone that is killed in the instrument there's a lot of damping happening so the next thing we need to look at very closely is damping that's very very important um, in a string instrument because actually 85 percent or 90 percent of the energy that we put into the instrument with a bow is reduced to heat and not, not sound so only 15 percent or so are transposed into actually sound from all the muscle energy that we put in now let's let's look at damping um, it's very very easy to understand like I have a rubber band here and a little bit of a weight all right so now it's steady and I move it, it goes one two three dead okay so the vibration that I initial initialized by adding some energy here stop is killed in in three vibrations so that's very very high damping here in this piece of rubber and um, so as you can see in this picture here for example this, this could be like this rubber band damping so you have three four waves and and, and and it's gone and of course that's not what we want in, an, in a musical instrument so we're using with materials that are vibrating much more freely um, damping is one I'll come back to damping a little later the other thing is um, the energy is also transposed so the, the some of the overtones are very strongly supported by the way the body of the instrument vibrates and you can see this very nicely on this picture we have the different modes of the instrument where it shows how in many different ways the top and the bottom of the instrument works um, and this happens all the all this all at the same time this is the most interesting bit and um, 
And when you try to um, measure the instrument's response on vibrations, what you get is a um, spectrum um, on which you see how vibrations are supported, which are the hills and um, on the peaks, and where they are not, which are the which is like these trolls here. Um, and you see the, the um, two different violins, and it's very clear that these two violins must sound very different one from the other. So the, the sound that comes from strings is modulated through this profile. Oh, and by the way, a bow has a very similar resonance profile. As you can see here, this is, uh, by the way, an, an Arcus S-series bow. So to repeat this, we have the modulation of the sound through the resonance profiles of the bows and the instruments and the bridges. Okay, now we need to go back to the very fundamental function of the bow. What exactly is the bow doing? The bow's key function is to put energy into this whole system. So it's, it's the feeder that we use, you know, for our body energy to go into the strings. It's almost like, like plugging a string only, only with a bow. Now let's, let's see how that works. Oops, no it doesn't. Um, all right, um, something is missing here. Yeah, you guess what? There's no rosin on the bow. So what happens is that we actually stick the bow on the string, pull it, and then when the force gets too high, it releases. And the more down force we apply, the further out we can pull the string, which means the more down force we apply, the higher the amplitude we get. So very simple, we want to play louder, we must press harder. And both faster. Um, that's the other trick. Um, but that, that's something that every violin student learns very early on, uh, or viola or cello, whatever. Um, oh, and by the way, that's another takeaway here. Um, bow hairs do not have hooks or anything like that. So bow hair is not wearing off in that regard. If the bow hair stops to grab the hair, uh, the, the, stops to grab the strings properly, what we have is we have dirty rosin or too much rosin or a mix of rosin or whatever. So you can, you can clean the bow. Um, but that's just a little side thing here. So mm, now let's come back to damping. What happens is that with every vibration of the string and of the body and with every bit of movement that's happening, damping occurs. Um, and um, we, we've, we've talked about rubber ha having a very, very high damping and it, it, it's up to about 100%, so a good piece of rubber can dampen a frequency in one go. Other materials have a lot less damping. For example, cork, um, 20%, um, which is still a lot. Um, we come to plastics like polypropylene, that's 3%. So that's a lot less already, but still quite a bit when it comes to, to musical instruments. So what? Uh, which is why very few musical instruments are made from plastic. Um, epoxy resin, which is stuff we use 
or which is used to make um, carbon fiber products, um, has got about 2% spruce and maple. Spruce for the top, maple for back and ribs, um, about 1%. Pernambuco, which is used for wooden bows, 0.5, so that's an even better resonating wood than, than spruce or maple, which is why it's chosen for bows. But then we come to the real good stuff, that's for example metals like aluminum, steel, titanium, has got only 0.1% damping, so only a tenth of spruce or maple, which is one reason why brass instruments are so loud because there's so very little damping on them okay but what's even better is crystals like glass diamonds and such kind of stuff they have almost no damping 0.01 percent it's close to zero close enough for our purposes and when we make a bow from carbon fiber um, we have these crystals which with almost no damping and then we have the resin so that, which is the reason why the resin content in a stick is so important about its resonance quality. So the lower the resin content, the better the resonance. Very simple. Um, so, okay, now we still haven't figured it out completely. We need to look at our little video again and then take a closer look into what's really happening there. We need to look deeper. Okay, so let's look at that video. And now, compared to the earlier GIF that I've shown you, which shows the principle of this, I've, I've attempted to make a new GIF a little more accurate and precise. And while doing that, I figured that something's amiss here. So if you look at the video, you will see where I've put these little red lines here at the stick and slip uh, points um, where the, the bow releases a string and catches it again. There are some quite strong deviations from this ideal mod model of stick and slip. So there's a lot more happening. Of course, and there must be. I mean, we still haven't explained the shark tooth yet, right? Okay. Now, um, there's a way we can look at it differently. And that is when we look at the forces between, or the force between the bow and the string. And how that changes with time. And that is what you can see in this picture. Below you can see the shark, oh no, the sawtooth profile again. This is basically the stick slip. This is what you see. What you don't see is the forces. And that is in the above, on the above line here. So that's a lot more complicated. But let's let's go through this. It, we can we can dissect it pretty easily. Alright. So First off, let's see where is our fundamental vibration. And that's, that's three fundamental vibrations here. Um, so what we have here is the fundamental vibration, which means, like for example, the C, right? That we've had with our overtone range. And the next thing we see is the stick and slip impulses, which define um, or which match um, this fundamental resonance, right? So from this, in, in the, and you can see in green and red letters here um, where this is exactly where exactly this is happening. So let's let's take a closer look again. Now, if we go to this GIF now. Um, we see that actually where the energy is transferred into the instrument, from the string into the instrument, is of course at the bridge and at the upper knot, which is where the stars are flashing here. And where the um, bow catches the string and releases the string, 
we have quite a bit of um, movement. So it's not a very simple catch and release. And that's what we can see when we look again at the, at the force picture here. So what happens actually is we have not only this primary slip impulse, but secondary slip impulses, which means the, the bow is not released in one go, or the string is not released. So they, they two are not separated in just one simple movement, but brrrt, they go. And when the bow catches the string again, it also goes brrrt. So we have a secondary stick impulse also, like secondary slip impulses. So which is all going towards our shock tooth design here, okay? These all count in. And what, what we also find, and now it's getting very interesting, is there are these little waves between the stick and slip impulses and that is what I call the coupling resonance and that is defined by the distance between the stick and the slip impulse and time seven is again the fundamental resonance and I've I've been I've been looking out for this um, coupling resonance for the longest time for many years actually and we've, I found it here in this, in this graph, in this measurement. And um, it clearly shows why the bow is so important for the sound of the instrument and the sound quality um, that we can pr produce with it. Um, as only this coupling resonance makes it possible for this whole stick slip effect to work nicely. And a clean and clear stick slip effect is exactly what we need to get a beautiful and big sound. And of course, again, thinking about damping, we want as little damping as possible. Um, so we want to have a strong stick and slip impulse and, and very little interference in, 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 in between. So what happens is that the bow makes this very fast, so seven times the fundamental, so it vibrates at the seventh, no, the sixth overtones with a seven-fold frequency of the tone that we are playing. So this coupling resonance is very, very important for a clean and big sound, um, or also a light sound, a pianissimo. And um, you must understand that this coupling resonance, so this sixth overtone, changes with every tone that we change, with the tr whether it's a thr trill or whether it's only a vibrato. The bow must always react to the change of the vibration in the string real quickly and without any resistance, if possible. Um, and the higher frequency here is really very important. Like if we look at the, um, like the six overtone, for example, from 440 hertz is already in the 3000 hertz area, 3080 hertz. So the bone must be able to resonate as at a very high frequency with little damping. So that's one of the tricks with damping. Let me just briefly go back to that. Um, of course, as damping is the percentage of energy that you lose with every vibration, higher frequencies are damped much faster than lower frequencies. Um, I can briefly show you this on the viola, like this A string stops real soon, while the C goes a lot longer um, and that's not because more energy is is ejected but there's a lot less damping over the same 
period of time in a lower frequency resonance. So, what's our takeaway here? Um, I think we have pretty much dissected how really the bow gets the energy into the instrument. It's like a plucking motion, only continuous and in a very, very high frequency. So we cannot see it, but it's actually very, very similar, like playing the mandolin or something like that. And, um, and the way the bow and the instruments modulate the sound and make it so very special, which is also the reason why different bows sound different on different instruments and also give a different tone character because they all modulate the sound that comes out of the instrument. So I hope you've enjoyed this and um, can take away a little bit um, and uh, yeah see you soon in the next video and don't forget to like share and subscribe. Thank you. Goodbye.